this with the band. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Glad to have you with us this evening. So nice to see all these faces. Good Thank evening. You. Thank you. Good evening, R.P. Thompson. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing, President Allen? Good. Good, good. Where's, where's your better, President better President half Allen. this evening? <laughs> 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 Oh, that's nice. Wonderful. So we have a chock full session for you this evening. So I'm going to give it about 10 more seconds and then we will launch in. Um, I'll start with some administrative notes. If you've been with us before, you know um, to please rename yourself um, and drop your, your present in the chat so that we can for our credentialed members. If, you, if you're not a credentialed member, you don't need to do it, but we want to make sure that our credentialed members receive their continuing education unit. So if you are a credentialed member either of NAP or AIP, uh, please drop your email address in the chat with your credentials so that we make sure that we send your certificate uh, that you can use as backup for your CEUs. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. I'm very excited about our topic tonight and certainly our speaker tonight, one of uh, PBC's own, um, our corresponding secretary, Nikki Ferrier is presenting. So we're looking forward to this topic. Uh, I'll take just a couple of seconds to tell you a little bit about Nikki. Um, Nikki Ferrier RP is a licensed social worker in the state of Pennsylvania. She earned her BASW and MSW in social work from the University of Pittsburgh, where she met her lifelong love, uh, Booker Ferrier, uh, as the impact services manager for United Way of Bucks County and previously the resource consultant for AHTN. She connects hundreds of homeless and in need families and individuals to life-sustaining resources like food, emergency shelter, and clothing. Nikki is also on the board. She's a vice president of the board of the Peace Center, and she is a facilitator for their annual Teen Peace and Social Justice Cent uh, Summit and Walking While Black, Love is the Answer program. Um, she gets to work alongside the community to tackle uncomfortable topics, facilitate crucial conversations, and explore meaningful and impactful solutions. Nikki's also the CEO of Antares Insight Solutions, LLC, where she works with other deliberative assemblies, providing foundational parliamentary trainings and workshops. RP Ferrier is also a member of NAP, um, AIP. Uh, she's a charter member of the Parliamentarians of Bucks County, and she's a proud life member of Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated. She's also a life member of the Jack and, of Jack and Jill of America Incorporated, and she serves as a parliamentarian for the Bucks County chapter of the Lynx Incorporated. So Nikki is very busy, and we're grateful uh, that she took time out for us tonight to bring a wonderful and insightful educational program. So with that, I will turn it over to Nikki Ferrier, RP. Thank you so much, President Allen. I wanted to say, who's that girl? Like Madonna said, but that girl is me. So thank you everybody and welcome. Uh, and thank you, RP Reeve. She will be driving my slides this evening. And just to conserve bandwidth, if you would like to, you can please turn off your cameras. Uh, we're in a bit of uh, weather over where I'm living. So I'm going to turn off mine and hopefully we will not be disrupted. Okay, so again, good evening everyone and thank you for joining us tonight to talk about the importance of just following the rules, specifically special rules of order and standing rules. Next slide. So when you look at this image, what does it bring to mind? For me, oh. it signifies, okay. It signifies the importance of following the rules. If you recall, there was just one important rule Dorothy was told to follow. And if she followed it, it would lead her to where she wanted to be. Just follow the rule, Dorothy. That was the answer, right? Follow the yellow brick road. So for the purpose of tonight's presentation, we will focus on two types of rules, typically found in deliberative assemblies to assist its members special rules of order and standing rules. Next slide. 
So what are, our, what are our learning objectives this evening? Well, tonight's foundational learning opportunity, as President Allen mentioned, is aimed at increasing our foundational knowledge of special rules of order and standing rules by defining them, highlighting their differences, showing how they interact and intersect with our bylaws and how they work in our organizations. I will also provide some discussion scenario script opportunities. So fair warning, I'm going to need a few volunteers and there'll be a few pop-up questions along the way. Moreover, I aim to leave you with some points to remember and hope that at the end, you are better equipped to follow the rules of your organization, understanding why they are so important and make changes to them if and when necessary. A brief pre and post assessment will also be shared just to determine how much you've learned throughout the presentation. Lastly, if you have any questions, please place them in the chat so we can address them accordingly. We will be monitoring the chat. And before we get started, if everyone can make sure they are on mute, we are recording tonight's presentation. So take a quick pulse right now and check to see if you're on mute and let's look at the flow of the presentation. Next slide. So here's our agenda, our pre and post assessment. We'll look at the special rules of order, standing rules, special rules versus standing rules, special rules and bylaws, and then we'll have some time for Q&A. Next slide. So pre-assessment questions. Before we fully get started, I just want you to think about what you already might know. Just take a moment Think of the best answers you have to these questions. Number one, which rule ranks higher in the hierarchy of rules, special rules of order or standing rules? Number two, which rules deals with the administrative matters of an organization? And number three, name one way special rules of order differ from standing rules. Now, hold your answers because it is the goal of this presentation that by the end, you will be able to answer these questions and more confidently and correctly. So let's get started. Next slide. So first, let's set, set the stage, right? Set the atmosphere. Our webinar tells us that any formal group with continuing existence that makes decisions democratically, that is to say any deliberative assembly, needs rules dealing with its own organization purposes and procedures to be followed. In order to understand how these rules work in an assembly or an organization, it's imperative that you know their order of rank. This is often referred to as the hierarchy of rules. Knowing the rank order of rules will assist you in understanding which rules supersede others, which rules yield to others. And this list can be found in the end brief on page 84. So I really do like to start the conversation with the hierarchy of rules when talking about rules, because it's very important to know which rules supersede and which rules yield. It's also imperative to know, because as you dig closer into particular rules, you'll wanna remember where they are in the rank order. So let's dive into our two rules that we're gonna look at tonight, special rules of order, and standing rules. Next slide. So the fourth highest ranking rule in the hierarchy of rules comes under the heading of rules of order, whose purpose is to facilitate the smooth functioning of the assembly or organization and to provide a firm basis for resolving questions of procedure that may arise. Rules of order are then divided into two categories, special rules of order, and parliamentary authority. And parliamentary authority we'll discuss at another time. But for tonight, we're just gonna focus on special rules of order in this category. Next slide. So when an assembly or an organization finds the need to vary the rules located in its identified parliamentary authority for its own particular purposes, it adopts special rules of order. Special rules of order relate to the orderly transaction of business in meetings and to the duties of officers in that connection. These rules allow your organization to talk about things and make decisions 
in the way that works best for you and your organization. They are also known as permanent rules, specific again to your organization that are used to guide your discussions and your meetings. Notice a lot of your, they're very personal. So they're not going to look the same organization to organization, nor should they. Next slide. So here are a few examples of some special rules of order. I know it's very small and typically we would not show pictures that you can hardly see, but it's just more so for you to have a quick visual of a service club, a youth sports group, even a political committee. And political committees are where you see special rules of order used most commonly. They can be listed, they can be bulleted or numbered so long as they are written clear and concise. So here you see examples, some are numbered, some are just uh, indented. So it's no one way to do them. They just need to be written very clearly and very concisely. Next slide. Special rules of order are rules that supplement or modify your parliamentary authority. These rules tweak the rules in your parliamentary authority that you have listed and it should be listed in your bylaws, what parliamentary authority you use, and they tweak them by making them specific, again, to your organization's needs. Organizations can benefit from adopting their own special rules of order. Otherwise, if RONR is your stated parliamentary authority, and for many of our organizations it is, your organization would be subject to things like each member being allowed to speak for 10 minutes at least twice during debate, or you'd only be able to use the standard order of business for an agenda, which does not provide for reorganization or efficiency. So those are just examples of why it's really important to maybe think about adopting special rules of order. Next slide. So as stated, an organization adopts these rules when it wants to do something different them the way it is listed in the parliamentary authority, and for our case, R-O-N-R. Important to note that special rules of order are not the most important single set of rules in defining your organization, but they are rules that are based on the specific need of an organization to accomplish a specific purpose for which the rule is adopted. The most important set of rules in your organization is your does anybody know? That will be a pop-up question later. It is your bylaws. So it's very important to know what's included and what's excluded in special rules of order. For instance, let's see if we can think of an example. Uh, an organization should not reinvent the wheel and include in your special rules of order things like how to make a motion, how to preside, or other common parliamentary rules that a parliamentary authority outlines. The reason is, is it's already listed in your parliamentary authority. So you don't need to have that in your special rules. However, whatever special rules of order the organization adopts should conform to common parliamentary law because common parliamentary law is all about protecting the rights of the minority, and absent members of an organization. Next slide. So we look briefly at what's typically excluded from special rules of order, but in the parla parliamentary reference manual, Modern Parliamentary Procedure, which can help guide you in your parliamentary practice, so I highly recommend purchasing this book, author Ray Kesey lays out this great list of what you typically will see in special rules of order. And you may want to screenshot this if you haven't seen it before. If you buy the book, this list can be found on page 127 of his book. What you typically see in special rules of order are the order of business, special rules governing length of speeches, methods of voting that's specific to your organization, conditions outlining certain types of votes, procedural rules that are different, not the same, but different than your stated parliamentary authority, and very important procedures for amending rules of order. 
So now that we know what types of headings that fall under special rules of order, let's briefly look at some ways they can be modified. And uh, RP Reeves, I'm hearing some feedback, so I don't know if everyone is on mute. Next slide. So unlike our bylaws, special rules of order can be suspended by a two thirds vote. Again, in modern parliamentary procedure, page 132, Ray Kesey says, quote, normally a two thirds vote is required to suspend temporarily a rule of order or to amend it, unless an assembly wishes to provide in its bylaws that a majority vote is sufficient following prior notice of intent to amend, end quote. This is because our bylaws supersede our rules of order. Think hierarchy of rules, always keep that in mind. And here's a quick governing tip. Click through RP Reeves. Meeting rules should be placed in special rules of order, not in bylaws, to avoid confusion as to whether a rule can be suspended or not. However, however, there is an exception to the ability of whether bylaws can be suspended. Does anyone know? That might come up later in the presentation too. So let's look at how special rules of order are adopted. Adopting special rules of order takes a bit of forethought. You see, she's thinking now, how do I do it? What do I do? What do I say? It's not really hard, especially if your rule has good rationale. RONR tells us that you need either a majority of the entire membership with no notice or two thirds of those present and voting if you give previous notice, meaning a heads up, to adopt special rules of order. Again, this threshold is warranted to protect the rights of the minority and those that may be absent. And note, to adopt special rules of order that are placed within the bylaws, the organization must follow the bylaws' rules for amending themselves. Very tricky there. Next slide. So now it's time to practice. Next slide. Here is a scenario that will allow us to practice adopting a special rule of order specific to the needs of a particular organization. So I'm gonna read the scenario and then we're gonna go into a practicum. The Blue Pearl Gavel Club has a custom of allowing tenured members to speak for long periods of time and as often as they like. Member A is tired of this practice and feels a formal rule should be put in place to curb this behavior, allowing more members of the opportunity to participate in debate. So before we start the practicum, I wanna make a quick note. Previous notice was not given for what we're about to practice. So the threshold to adopt this special rule of order with pre without previous notice is a majority of the entire membership. And the membership consists of 50 people, just for our example's sake. But if previous notice had been given, the vote threshold to adopt would have been two thirds. Okay, now, can I have a member A, next slide, a member B and a chair? And you could just come off mute. Do we have I'll a member? I'll, have, I'll be member A. Okay, thank you. I'll be member B. Thank you, and then we need a chair. And I'll be the chair. Thank you so much. Okay, the floor is yours. Um, Madam Chair. Chair recognizes member A. I move that the following motion be made a special rule of order, that members of the Blue Pearl Gavel Club be allowed to speak on a motion for up to two minutes and to speak no more than twice during debate. I second. It has been moved and seconded that the following motion be made a special rule of order that members of the Blue Pearl Gavel Club be allowed to speak on a motion up to two minutes and speak no more than twice during debate. Is there any debate? The question is on the adoption of the motion as a special rule of order 
that members of the Blue Pearl Gavel Club be allowed to speak on a motion for up to two minutes and speak no more than twice during debate. All those in favor, please rise. Be seated. Those opposed, please rise. Be seated. There are 41 yes and nine no's. There is a majority of the entire membership in agreement, so the motion that the members of the Blue Pearl Gavel Club be allowed to speak on a motion for up to two minutes and speak no more than twice during debate is adopted and this special rule of order is now in effect. The next order of business is... Thank you so much. And so notice that once the special rule of order is adopted, it takes effect immediately. Thank you. Next slide. So now, nope, go back one. Let's do a quick knowledge check. Show what you know. True or false, special rules of order contain the most important single set of rules for defining your organization and its governance and their content remains binding and enforceable only to the extent they don't conflict with your charter. Is that true or is that false? Next slide, put your answers in the chat. I see some answers in the chat. Thank you, thank you. All right, let's see what the answer is. Next slide. The answer is false, you all are on it. Special rules of order are not the most important single set of rules in defining your organization, but they are rules that are based on the specific need of an organization to accomplish a specific purpose for which the rule is adopted. The most important set of rules are, you wanna put it in the chat? Let's see who knows. What are the most important set of rules? I see some answers coming up in the chat. Thank you, thank you. Click through RP Reeves. You are correct. The bylaws are considered the most important single set of rules for defining your organization. And remember the hierarchy of rules, the bylaws rank number three in that hierarchy. Very good, next slide. So now let's look at our next rule of the evening, the fifth highest ranking rule in our hierarchy of rules standing rules. Many organizations need a few rules of a semi-permanent nature, which they can modify or rescind without the delay and trouble of amending bylaws or rules of order. That is where standing rules can come into play. Very, very helpful. Next slide. So I went ahead of myself. When you see this picture, I think of a helping hand that's exactly what standing rules do. They are another set of rules that many organizations find helpful. They deal with the details of administration of an assembly or an organization, and they provide for the day-to-day -day operation of your organization. They are generally not adopted at the time a society is organized, but individually if and when the need arises. Standing rules are also known to keep continuity in your organization so that new members do not need to perpetually ask longtime members what to do and when to do it. Next slide. So here are a few examples of some standing rules. And in the middle, those are our standing rules from the parliamentarians of Bucks County. These rules are typically numbered and they are very specific to your assembly or your organization. So just like special rules of order, one set of standing rules would not necessarily work for all organizations because there are gonna be things in them that are very specific and germane to only your organization. Next slide. So let's examine them a little closer. Standing rules may not be stated in your adopted parliamentary authority, but are considered desirable to operate effectively. So they may not be as strong as the rules that are listed in your parliamentary authority, but they are still needed and can still be very helpful. They are usually of minor importance by comparison with rules of order, um, but a fun fact, I like fun facts, if you've attended a convention, you might hear the term standing rules and think, oh, well, they don't sound administrative. They, they sound all encompassing. 
And that's true. At a convention, usually a convention in the beginning will adopt some rules to be enforced during the entirety of the convention. And those rules are called standing rules. But this term is used in a very special sense because it may include parliamentary rules adopted at the convention. So I know that's a little confusing, but those of you who are really into RONR know that there are a lot of confusing things <laughs> in that parliamentary authority. And this is just one of them. Um, but I thought that was a fun fact to share. And then in addition to the fun fact, uh, at PBC, we like to do things called beyond the book. We like to go beyond the book sometimes and share a nugget or two about a topic that you're not going to find in R. So a procedure known as suspend the rules is sometimes used in the United States House of Representatives. And what is it used as? It's used to quickly pass non-controversial bills from the floor. So very interesting that uh, suspend the rules or standing rules have so many multiple uh, meanings and terms, but for the purposes of deliberative assemblies, they were to provide administrative guidance for your organization. So let's briefly look at how they can be altered. Next slide. Standing rules remain in effect until rescinded or amended, but can also be suspended by a majority vote or often by unanimous consent. And if this application is only within the context of a meeting, suspension of the rules only lasts for that meeting. Very important to know. Next slide. So here's another helpful chart provided again by author Ray Kesey from the Parliamentary Manual, Modern Parliamentary Procedure. I will try to show this book at the end. Um, I do think it's a very helpful uh, parliamentary manual to add to your parliamentary library. Uh, but this list is uh, what you will typically find in an organization's standing rules. Uh, it is not exhaustive, uh, but it does provide a general guide uh, to some of the standard topics you may find that you may typically find. So you may wanna screenshot this as well, but again, it's not exhaustive. Um, and again, this is found on page 127 of that manual. Okay, so you'll see time for meetings, location of meetings, uh, policy on guests at meetings, if you need that, uh, policy on special meetings, if they're closed to guests, uh, responsibility for refreshments, noise control, light, general comfort. Some organizations need that, some don't. Uh, but again, most importantly, a procedure for amending them. Very good to have, makes it very convenient when and if that time comes where you need to amend them, that the procedure for doing so is listed right in the rules. So now let's look at how standing rules come into being. Next slide. So standing rules may be adopted at any meeting. A main motion can bring a standing rule into being, meaning adopted by a majority vote without previous notice, provided it does not conflict with or amend any existing rule already in place, unless otherwise stipulated in what? The bylaws, because again, the bylaws outrank standing rules. Once a standing rule, once your standing rules are adopted though, very important to know that the document must be and should be kept up to date and each new standing rule that is added should record the date that it was adopted. Just in case there are any questions from the membership, each new standing rule that's adopted should have in parentheses the date that it was adopted. That is a best practice. Next slide. So what about amending a standing rule? A standing rule can be amended by a two thirds vote or a majority of the entire membership without previous notice or a majority vote with previous notice. And we know there are three ways to amend something. So I won't go into how we amend something, um, but just know that our standing rules can be amended. They can be adopted, then they can be amended. Let's see what else we can do with standing rules. Next slide. So you knew this part was coming. Standing rules can be suspended and they can be suspended by using the incidental motion, suspend the rules. 
The object of this motion is to suspend one or more rules applicable to the assembly, such as rules contained in the parliamentary authority, special rules of order, or in this case, standing rules. This motion is often used to deviate from the agenda or allow for other special circumstances to occur. Suspension of the rules is limited though, strictly to procedural rules. So it's very important to remember that an assembly cannot just suspend uh, a rule that's stated in your statute or your charter. Um, the assembly cannot suspend a rule of basic common parliamentary law, such as, let me see, um, governing notice or quorum or vote requirements or voting methods. You cannot suspend those types of rules. Um, you cannot suspend a rule in the bylaw unless a specific section of the bylaw provides for its own suspension. Very, very important to remember that. Um, you cannot suspend a rule in the bylaws unless the bylaws say you can do that. So important to know that suspension of the rules cannot deprive members of any fundamental rights. So if you don't know anything else about suspending a rule, know that if it sounds like it's gonna deprive a member of fundamental rights of membership, it cannot be suspended. That's just a good, uh, that's a good way to put a pin in that to say, wait a minute, is this going to infringe on someone's membership rights or not? If it is, cannot be suspended. Next slide. So this slide just shows you briefly the uh, list of the standard descriptive characteristics of the incidental motion to suspend the rules. And you can look at all of this information in more detail. The, the quotation is there in ROWNR 12th edition 25, two and three. You see it takes precedence as an incidental motion. It applies to no other motion. It can have no other motion applied to it. It does require recognition from the chair. It requires a second. It is not debatable. It is not amendable. And it does require a two thirds vote to pass. So again, like to go a little bit beyond the book and share a nugget or two about a topic, click through RP Reeves. When things get so confusing in debate that neither the chair nor the parliamentarian knows how to proceed, because there's just been so many motions thrown out and I wanna suspend the rules and this, this, that, and the other. There is one last ditch motion to suspend the rules that you can move in order to get a fresh start. And that motion is called the Gordian Knot motion. I was fascinated when I researched and found that. So you can read more information about the Gordian Knot motion in the standard code of parliamentary procedure and that is written by Alice Sturgis, and it's located on page 86. And I'll show that book at the end as well. I should have put a picture of the books in here, but I'll show that uh, picture of that book as well at the end. So that's just a little parley nerd out-ism that we like to do here in PBC. Next slide. So now it's time to practice again. Next slide. Important to note for this scenario that previous notice was not required to move the motion to suspend the rules and the vote threshold is therefore a majority. The total membership of the Blue Pearl Gavel Club is 50. So just a reminder. So here's the scenario. In the Blue Pearl Gavel Club, there is a standing rule that states, members must pay a nickel for every ah or um they say during the meeting. It is a way for the group to make some additional cash and improve their orator skills. At tonight's meeting, member A speaks up because she sees an opportunity as she cannot help but saying ah and um often. How many of us have been there? Uh, um, that's 10 cent right there. Next slide. So again, I'm going to need a member A, a member B, and a chair. Any volunteers? Member A, member B, and a chair. I'll be member A. Member A. I can be the chair. Okay, we got member, member A. B. 
Okay, we have all three. All right, the floor is yours. Okay, I'll be member A. I think I, I said I would be member A. Okay, um, thank you, Michelle. Chair recognizes member A. I'm sorry, um, Mr. or Miss or Madam Chair. Chair recognizes member A. I move to suspend the rules which require us to collect money for each uh and um at, at tonight's Pearl, um sorry, Blue Pearl Gavel Club meeting. Second. It is moved and seconded to suspend the rules which require the Blue Pearl Gavel Club to collect money for each ah and um at tonight's meeting. All those in favor, rise, be seated. Those opposed, rise, please rise, be seated. The vote is 40 yes, nine no's. Since there is a majority in the affirmative, the motion is carried. And the rule which requires us to collect money for each ah uh, and um at tonight's Blue Pearl Gavel Club meeting is suspended for the duration of this meeting. The next order of business is... Thank you so much. And, and R.P. Uh, Kelly, I'm sure if someone had moved this rule when you were... Uh, leading our youth gavel club, um, you may have made some money because I don't think any of the kids would have known to do this. So <laughs> Exactly. That's just a good one. <laughs> so I thought, I thought of you in all your gavel club meetings uh, when I wrote this script. So thank you so much. So <laughs> as long as the rule does not apply to parliamentary procedure, the motion to suspend the rules can be adopted by a majority vote because we learned earlier that a rule relating to parliamentary procedure, i.e. a rule of order, must have a two-thirds vote to be adopted. So you can see R 12th edition 2514 to read a little bit more about what voting strength is needed to suspend the rules. And though this motion is not debatable, you also might wanna look at R 12th edition 4331, which explains the occasion of justifying a brief discussion outside of debate. So just so you know, even though there are some motions that are not debatable, there is a little leeway in ROR that allows for, I'd say, a discussion, conversation, a question, if you will. You just have to be very mindful and very careful to not allow that brief question or discussion to turn into debate or to turn into a rant or to turn into a speech, because that's not really what the allowance is for, especially again, if it's a non-debatable motion. So very important to know that. Okay, next slide. So before we do this quick knowledge check, I think I see a question in the chat, which is the recommended term motion carried or motion adopted? Uh, definitely motion carried. Uh, you don't typically hear motion adopted, although some people might use it and it might be more of a custom to use it. But typically uh -oh. you hear that the motion motion carries or carried, RP Allen, I mean, PRP Allen. Is it carried or carries? R RP Ferrier, mm -hmm. just a, a quick note um, that, that adopted is actually the preferred term. Oh, um, so we're yes. all learning. <laughs> right. So it, it, you can use both, but I think the preferred term is a, is adopted. Okay. So reverse that, uh, Miss uh, Gail Barnes Johnson. Adopted is the preferred term. So thank you for that question. I wanted to stop and say and answer that question because others may have had that question too. And as we're doing these learning opportunities, this is when you want to ask those questions and get that clarification uh, because we're all still learning and that's why they're learning opportunities. So thank you for that. So quick knowledge check, should standing, oh, here we go. Should the standing rules document be kept up to date? I say yes or no, put your answers in the chat. Should the standing rules document be kept up to date? 
Lots of answers flowing in the chat. Next slide. Yes, the standing rules document should be kept up to date. And again, each new standing rule should record the date that it was adopted. That's for continuity, clarity, um, and just good old CYA. So very good, very good. All right, next slide. So as we come to a close, come to the end of our time together, just taking a foundational look at special rules of order and standing rules. Let's look at how, let's look at a few examples of um, differences between standing rules of standing rules, special rules of order, how they differ from our bylaws, how they intersect with our bylaws. Uh, let's just take a, a minute and look at a few examples. All right, next slide. So special rules of order govern the conduct of business by an organization specific to the needs of the organization. Whereas standing rules cover non-procedural subjects and should be kept up to date. So that's one way they differ. Special rules of order take priority over those in the parliamentary authority as it is listed higher in the hierarchy of rules. Standing rules are the lowest ranking rule and takes priority over nothing but customs. But if your organization really likes its customs, it is wise to make them a more permanent rule. Next slide. Special rules of order may be suspended with a two thirds vote, so long as it is limited to procedural rules controlling the conduct of business. But standing rules can be suspended by a majority vote unless the assembly requires otherwise. Next slide. So now let's look at some ways, some specific examples of how bylaws and standing rules intersect. So bylaws might state how many general meetings of an association are held, whereas your standing rules may tell you when and what time those meetings are held. Next slide. Bylaws may give the specific number of officers uh, for a specific organization like the PTA or the school board, but standing rules may list the specific administrative duties of those particular officers. Next slide. Bylaws may set the rights and responsibilities of an organization's officers, members, et cetera, but the standing rules may list general procedures that officers and members may follow. So you see, they really work tandem, hand in hand. Next slide. So here's an example of how bylaws differ from both special rules of order and standing rules. Bylaws cannot be suspended unless they provide for their own suspension within the bylaws. However, special rules of order and standing rules can be suspended. And here's a quick uh, mistake to avoid. Don't make the mistake of duplicating items in your bylaws, in your special rules of order, and in your standing rules. I'm gonna say it again. Don't make the mistake of duplicating items in your bylaws, in your special rules of order, in your standing rules. There's no reason to have things in all of those places. They each do have their purpose. And so you really wanna consult your parliamentary authority as well as the wants and needs of your membership when making the determination. But if you do put them and duplicate them in multiple places, it'll make updating them a nightmare, make it very complicated, and it will make it more likely that your bylaws and standing rules will eventually conflict at some point, which you definitely don't wanna do. That is a hot mess to straighten out. So just don't duplicate. Be very mindful of what rules you're putting in what rule. Next slide. So here are a few special points to remember. When an assembly or an organization finds the need to vary the rules located in its identified parliamentary authority, that's really when it wants to consider adopting special rules of order. We learned that special rules of order tweak 
the rules that are already listed in your parliamentary authority so that they, they really work specific for your organization. And special rules of order should not conflict with your organization's bylaw, charter, or the highest ranking rule in the hierarchy of rules, the law. Next slide. Click through. Thank you so much. Standing rules relate to the details of administration of a society. They will tell you when and where in the specifics when dealing with the administration of your organization. Uh, a standing rule is generally not adopted at the time a society is organized, primarily because you're just organizing. So you don't really quite know what all your needs are gonna be just yet. Uh, but they do work to keep continuity in your organization and they help newer members acclimate quicker when joining organizations because they are the standing administrative rules. Next slide. If there is a conflict between two rules, the highest ranking rule will prevail. So it's very important to know and always be mindful of the hierarchy of rules. The incidental motion to suspend the rules does permit an assembly to take action that otherwise would be prevented. So you wanna change something, you do have that option to move that incidental motion to suspend the rules, understanding what the standard descriptive characteristics are and following those guidelines. And the vote required to adopt, amend, or suspend a particular rule is really determined by the nature and the content of that rule, according to what we've learned in ROnR. Next slide. So that was a lot of information in a short amount of time, but let's take a moment and show what you've learned. Next slide. So now we've come to our post-assessment. We have a few questions. We're gonna ask for you to put your answer in the chat and just show what you know. So number one, a blank relates to the details of administration of a society. Is that a special rule of order, a bylaw, or a standing rule? Just place your answer, A, B, or C in the chat. Order word, yes, either one. Okay, I see a lot of answers flowing in the chat. So the answer is C, a standing rule relates to the details of administration of a society. Thank you. Number two, blank supersedes any rules in the parliamentary authority with which they may conflict. Is that a standing rule, a special rule, or bylaws? Okay, I see a lot of answers. So number two, the answer actually is B, special rules of order supersede any rules in the parliamentary authority with which they may conflict. Remember, rules of order are broken into two sections, special rules of order and parliamentary authority. And so special rules of order outrank parliamentary authority. We say outrank, we also say supersede. They are interchangeable terms. So special rules of order supersede any rules in the parliamentary authority with which they may conflict because special rules of order outrank the parliamentary authority. Number three, blank generally are not adopted at the time a society is organized, but individually if and when the need arises. Is that standing rules, bylaws, or special rules of order? Okay, I see a lot of answers flowing in the chat. Thank you. So I see a lot of correct answers. The answer is A, standing rules generally are not adopted at the time a society is organized, but individually if and when the need arises. Okay, next slide. Blank can be suspended by a majority vote for the duration of the session, but not for longer. Is that bylaws, is that standing rules, or is that special rules? Very good, I see a lot of answers in the chat. The answer is B, 
standing rules can be suspended by a majority vote for the duration of the session, but not for longer. Number five, blank can be suspended by a two thirds vote as explained in R 12th edition 2514. Is that special rules of order, bylaws or standing rules? I see a lot of answers in the chat. Okay, the answer is A, you are correct. Special rules of order can be suspended by a two thirds vote as explained in ROR 12th edition. Number six, any blank are adopted separately from the bylaws. Any blank are adopted separately from the bylaws. Is that standing rules? Is that special rules of order? Or is that both? Standing rules and special rules of order. Very good, I see a lot of answers coming into the chat. The answer is B, standing rules and special rules of order are adopted separately from the bylaws. All right, next slide, number seven, which rule ranks higher in the hierarchy of rules, special rules of order or standing rules? Very good, the answer is C, special rules of order outrank standing rules in the hierarchy of rules. So it's always important to remember the hierarchy of rules. Number eight, the most important set of rules governing an assembly are, is it A, the bylaws, B, standing rules, or C, special rules of order? The answer is A, very good. Your bylaws are the most important set of rules governing your assembly. And lastly, number nine, which rules are considered semi-permanent? Semi-permanent. Are those standing rules, bylaws, or special rules of order? This one can be a little tricky too, because I mentioned permanent and I mentioned semi-permanent. There are some rules that are considered permanent and then there are some rules that are considered semi-permanent. So the answer to this one is actually A, standing rules are considered semi-permanent, special rules of order are considered permanent rules. So very good, thank you, thank you. Next slide, now you're off, right? We know what this picture is, they're almost there. Well, they thought they were almost there. We know how the story goes. But each organization's goal should be to conduct the most effective and efficient meeting possible. That is the ultimate destination, though for Dorothy it was home. For us, we want to conduct the most efficient and effective meeting possible. So I hope this learning opportunity tonight provided you with a deepened foundational knowledge of these particular rules, special rules of order and standing rules that govern our assemblies because as Dorothy once said, there is no place like home and home for us is just a great meeting experience. So thank you all. Next slide. So th these are the references I use to create this presentation this evening. Next slide. Here are my professional and service organizations where I share my time and my talent and uh, dare I say some of my funds. <laughs> Next slide. Are there any questions? Yes, you were gonna put a picture of the last book up. Yes, I'm gonna hold, I'm gonna try to hold them both up. So bear with me. Thank you for attending. So this is, I don't know, uh, R.P. Reeves, if you can spotlight me with this one. This is uh, Modern Parliamentary. Okay, here we go. So this is, uh, you got to love the virtual background. Here we go. Modern Parliamentary Procedure is sort of like a green, marbly looking book. So this reads like a regular book. It doesn't read like the way R.O.N.R. reads. This is more of a parliamentary manual. Um, so this is a great addition to have if you're building a parliamentary library. 
Uh, I wish I could swing around and show you my library. Those who know me well know I really, really love to read. So I, I try to cop every parliamentary book I can find. And then the other book I believe I mentioned was the uh, Standard Code. Okay, I gotta get a good spot. The American Institute of Parliamentarians, AIP, uh, their Standard Code of Parliamentary Procedure. This is written by uh, Alice Sturgeon. So this is really Sturgis. So this is really a good reference book to have too. So thank you all. If there are no questions, I appreciate you all coming out tonight to this foundational learning opportunity. And uh, as a member of Parliamentarians of Bucks County, we hope to see you at our next training. Thank you so much, R.P. Farrier. I just want to make sure we give an opportunity if there's anything um, that R.P. Farrier shared that was an aha moment for you, given your experience in your other deliberative assemblies. Um, if, you're, if there is a special rule of order or a standing rule that you think would be absolutely critical to improving the meetings that you attend, um, we want to. We have a couple minutes. We'd love to hear hear anything that you um, that this has brought up for you. So. Just want to make space for that. Yes, RP Anthony Thompson. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. What I'm gonna look into is that Gordian knot motion. I'm I'm interested in finding out what that's all about. Uh, because I, I I like to have some some tools in the bag. So <laughs> definitely want to take a look at that. That was an aha moment. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh oh, Nikki, we can't hear you. At least I'm I can't. I'm oh, like, it was, yeah. it was an aha moment for me too. And I said, ooh, if things get real sticky, I'm going to say, Gordy and not. No, <laughs> it's a way to do it. We just got to figure out how to do it. But I thought that was brilliant too. So thank you. No, no, I appreciate uh, uh, RP uh, Faria for that little gem. I so looked it up while, that's why I couldn't turn the slides quick because I was too busy looking up the Gordy and not. But thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, Gail Barnes Johnson. Thank you. I would appreciate if you could give us those reference sites again that you, uh, I was trying to get a snapshot of it. That oh, you absolutely. In your presentation. Yes, absolutely. Um, R.P. Reeves, could you pull it back up and go back to that slide? I am missing one book on there, um, but there it is. Do you see it? I have it. Thank you. Awesome. You're welcome. You're welcome. Well, I can't see if there is, okay, there we go. Just wanted to see if anyone else had their hand up. I don't see any hands up. So I will uh, do the honors of closing out tonight's uh, learning opportunity. Again, I want to say thank you to RP Nikki Ferrier, um, who is a, a charter member and a core um, part of the success of the parliamentarians of Bucks County. So thank you so much for the time and the work that goes into these presentations. Thank you for doing that. I wanna thank everyone who came and spent part of their Sunday afternoon or evening with us. Um, we hope that you found there to be at least one thing, one nugget uh, that you can take away from this. Um, I also want to make sure that we provide the link to the evaluation for tonight's session. I'm gonna drop that in the chat very quickly so that everyone hopefully will just take a couple of minutes to um, provide us with feedback on tonight's learning opportunity. Um, you'll also, if you know, if you've been here before, you know that we will send out um, a tip sheet and we'll again send a reminder to please complete the, the evaluation. But in the meantime, if you have any feedback or you want to say something to Nikki as it relates to feedback on her presentation, I'm going to ask her to drop her email address in the chat for you um, and ask you to please take advantage of the opportunity to give her any feedback or ask any questions to her directly. So with that, I want to just say thank you all for joining us again this evening. Hope everyone has a wonderful and a blessed week. And we look forward to seeing you at, at, at our ne next learning opportunity, unless we see you at one of yours next. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Have a good night. Thanks. Good night. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank everybody. Have a good night. Good night. Thanks. Good night. Thank you.